Good evening, Gita, and thank you for taking time to chat with us today. It's my pleasure to be here. Great, thank you. Uh, you know, as a result of the emergence of the corona, uh, coronavirus pandemic, this past several months has been trying for us all. Here in Vancouver, on the shores of Western Canada, we've been really spared the worst of it. In British Columbia, with a population of about three and a half million people, we recorded just over to date, 16,000 cases of COVID-19. 13,000 of these people have fully recovered, but tragically, we suffered 273 deaths. Now, our Hever Kadisha serves the Jewish community in the entire metropolitan Vancouver area, and we have not as yet, thank God, handled any deaths from COVID-19. I know this is a very different story from what you've experienced in the metro New York area. Perhaps you can tell us. Indeed it is. We were hit hard, strong, and long. Um, the numbers of deaths that we were dealing with were unprecedented. Even before you deal with the, with the issues surrounding those deaths, um, New Montefiore Cemetery, one of the large cemeteries in the area, normally handles 30 burials a week, was handling 600 a week over the month of April. Funeral homes were inundated. We had the challenge of volume, and then we had the challenge of what do we do in this unprecedented crisis where we really don't know too much about the disease transmission and about how to guard our health and the safety of our Hebra members. For example, on the second night of Pesach, where most people in the New York metro area were sitting down to the Seder, one of the Hebras that I work with had women working on Taharas from the minute they could start the second night, going on till 2 a.m., coming home, collapsing into bed, and the men then went to do their Taharas. A friend of mine who's a member of that Hebra did 14 Taharas in that evening, where we normally we try to spread it out and not have people even do more than two in a night or four in a week because we don't want to burn out our teams. It was totally unprecedented, physically draining, and mentally and emotionally draining. And then we had to learn about the disease and how it's transmitted. And there were so many rumors and so many, for lack of a better word, the technical term is bubamysis, about how the disease is transmitted. Now, how do we keep our Tahara team safe? We're working in a small room, we're dealing with bodily fluids, whether the member of the Hebra may have been exposed to COVID and then exposing other members in the, on the team to it, or if the deceased is a source of infection. And that took a lot of trial, error, and honestly, a lot of davening to keep us safe. Oh, I can imagine. And, you know, really, this is why we've invited you to chat with us here tonight. We witnessed the media reports. We watched it on television news uh, on how COVID-19 really ripped through the New York area. and you know, really how it ripped through the New York, New York Jewish community. And we want to know, you know, how, you know, how did this impact? I know you've already spoken a little bit about it, but can you drill down and tell us how this really impacted the Hebra Kedisha as a whole and how members were handling it at the time, you know, even from a mental, emotional perspective? So it really affected us even, I would say, before the moment of death. In a shul-based Hebra, such as the one that I had, we try to be there for the family. We kind of combine Bikur Cholim as well as doing the Tahara. And now we couldn't. We couldn't visit the sick. If somebody passed at home, and we did have members that did, they were in hospice care, not necessarily from COVID, I couldn't give them a hug. I couldn't give the family members a hug. I couldn't, I couldn't pat somebody on the back. I'm walking in with a mask. It's not me. You can't read my face. So that was the first level where the ability to interact with the survivors was heavily impacted. And a lot of my, my team members felt that that impacted on their ability to be effective because we're doing what we do for the deceased, but we're also doing it for the living. And we, we don't have the ability to do that. I'm going to skip the Tahara for a minute, but then talk about the funeral and the Shiva. 
And the same thing, a funeral where you didn't have a minion, a funeral where we're only allowing family members to come or maybe not even all of them. And we're all dressed in space suits of Shiva where there's nobody there. And even the mourners are sitting six feet apart in masks. Yeah. It was unprecedented. It was, it was heartbreaking. And then we had to deal with the Tahara itself. We know that the essence of the Tahara process is to treat the deceased with the utmost of dignity, without discussion, without, oh, look at that. What do you, did you ever see anything like that? We try very hard in our Hebra to minimize this talking in general as we're doing the Tahara. And here we are. We're dealing with something which may be endangering ourselves, and we need to not talk about it. We need to engage in procedures, spritzing bleach all over the place, which maybe you could say is not so dignified. Um, at the beginning, we did curtail some of the technical details of the Tahara. We may not have washed this carefully. Um, some chevras use a mikvah and chose not to use it for COVID patients, instead just throwing the nine kavim of water on them. Some chevras were only laying the tachrichim on top of the deceased. And it hurts. It hurts. Here you are. You're trying to render the final dignity to the image of God. Man is created in the image of God. And this is what I'm doing. And it really took a lot of discussion, a lot of emotional work, I have a general practice that after a Tahara, I will text the members of the Tahara group about a half an hour later, say, thank you so much. Maybe a point that wasn't noted in the Tahara room, like we need to be more careful about X, Y, Z, or you handled ABC in a great way, whatever it is. My texts since COVID have been, do you feel safe? Do you want to talk? Right. And I, that's been yeah. part of it. I, you know, and, I, and I, we can relate to that because while we haven't here in, our, in Vancouver, thank God, had to deal with COVID-19 specifically, we have nonetheless, nonetheless have to, had to, you know, have, you know, taking care of the deceased and their families uh, from other things. I mean, not everybody who came through your Shepherd Kadisha uh, died from COVID. I mean, you had your normal you know, workload, I'll call it for lack of a better word, to deal with as well. Um, so we have felt that we felt it in terms of our Hebrew Kedisha members working, you know, in a different kind of an environment, you know, in the Tahara room and particularly for families and, you know, some may be watching here tonight who have suffered the loss of a loved one and have had to uh, go through a funeral. You know, a funeral is a, uh, you know, it's a very tactile, you know, the, the, the support that we need is very tactile. You know, we, we hug each other and we touch each other and we shake hands and, you know, there's, there's physical contact, which is part of the grieving and the grieving process. And so we've had to experience that as well. It's interesting that you would raise those things. And that's what we certainly share in common around this is that we've had to maintain our, I hate to use the term social distancing. I know we use social, it's physical distancing. And that's made it very difficult. Shiva calls, same thing. You know, I mean, Shiva's, you know, everything is different. You know, it's, um, I know that, you know, this happened all, you know, it happened around Pesach time for you. You did touch on, on, on Pesach, you know, in general, you know, I, and I think you've covered Pesach. Is there anything else you want to add about that holiday that is such a normally a wonderful time in our families? Is there, you know, what... So I think the general feeling, and myself as a grandmother who loves to have everybody around the table for Pesach, I think everybody was depressed about Pesach. Um, I told my husband, I said the Manishtana for the first time in 40 plus years, he owes me a big present. He's not getting away with a Tonka toy um, because I said the Manishtana. And that was, I think, having that overlay of just the holiday being different for everybody before you even deal with Hebra Kadisha was one factor. Everybody walked around sad and upset. Then there's always that feeling in your stomach, and I'm sure you have the same thing. Anytime there's a holiday, you know that it's, the, not meaning any disrespect, the work is going to pile up because people who pass away over the holiday, our chevra does not bury on the second day. There are chevras that do. So that means that I have, at the very least, two and a half days of potential deaths anytime there's a yontif. 
So you had that. Plus, you knew it was going to be harder. Plus, then you have dealing with the shivas after the yontif, because even if you buried on Cholamoid, you still have the shiva afterwards. So I always have like a little bit of a pit in my stomach when I turn my phone back on after the second day. Like, what am I going to hear and see? And did I, well, because of COVID, I didn't walk to the hospital, but usually over Yontiv, if something happens, I end up walking to the hospital to make sure that things are, are running smoothly and things are done in an appropriate fashion. So you had the joy of the holiday was mitigated just by the circumstances of COVID. And then you had, as always for a Hebrew member, who knows what's going to happen over Yontiv, just as a Hebrew member. And then you had and you know you're in the middle of, and I'll use a Pesach appropriate word, a plague. And how do you handle that? How do you deal with that as well? You're concerned about family members. On the one on the one hand, my mother is Kinahara in her 90s, living alone, totally functional. Couldn't bring her to my house for the holiday. It was impossible. Okay, so that there's the that overlay. And it's yantiv, and you have to deal with it. And we went through it. It was, it, there was a lot of conversations between heads of Hebras. It was interesting because we have kind of like, in, unlike in Vancouver, where you have the one Hebra, there are multiple Hebras. I myself serve on four different Hebras. So I could talk to myself if I want to talk to heads of Hebras. But we did have conversations throughout, which really helped. If somebody heard about a better mask, if somebody heard about a different piece of equipment or a new, uh, a new finding from the CDC, we would share it amongst ourselves. And I think that helped at dealing, especially in those first days where there was so much non-information and misinformation. Or, you know, and, and Pesach was a difficult time, obviously. You know, the whole pandemic was new. We're hearing new information about what we should, what we shouldn't do. That changes all the time. Um, and that was Pesach. But we fast forward to the next set of holidays. We're into Rosh Hashanah. We're into Yom Kippur, uh, you know, Sukkot. Um, did you, f- and now obviously your I know that things might be, they, they kind of heated up a little bit again, but I don't think you saw quite the number of people passing from COVID-19 is what we understand. Um, and it was a bit quieter in general, but how did that feel? I mean, now you don't have the Heber Kaddish work piling up on you, but you certainly are still dealing with social distancing. Was How different from Pesach was your, was your high holidays? Um, it was somewhat different, but not as different as I would have liked it to be. Um, I do have members that already have antibodies and I'm able to send them if I feel that it's a case where I really need somebody to literally be able to give a hug. I will say, will you please go? I fortunately or unfortunately don't have antibodies. I was so sick. I don't have any antibodies. We don't know why. So I need to be careful. Um, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur were the awe-inspiring high holidays that they are. We were concerned about illness. Actually, what happened was for the for the month between Tisha B'Av and let's say the two weeks before, for that month, Tisha B'Av until almost before Rosh Hashanah, we had a series of weddings, bar mitzvahs, parties, whatever, which I've now learned the term were called super spreader events. We actually, sadly, where I live in Far Rockaway, we were a red zone. Um, We were declared a red zone. We had, there was a wedding, which was a super spreader event. The mother of the groom passed away, as did one of the guests. So we didn't have a lot of deaths, but we had these two targeted deaths, people that you knew that were friends with each other, that, that, we assume only God knows exactly where they got it, but we're going to assume that something happened at this event. And people had started to let their guard down. You would walk into shul and see people with a mask. Well, maybe under the nose, maybe it's a beard guard, maybe I'm wearing it on my wrist. And then they shut us down again. Simchas Torah was 10 men in shul. That's it. That's it. And it, it was like a slap and we needed to re rejigger. Fortunately, we haven't suffered the number of deaths, but each and every death hurts. Mm-hmm. But there is illness. There is, um, there's a, 
there's a concern for transmission. And there's also, I think, an attitudinal shift, and I'm not sure where it's going yet in terms of the blame game. Mm -hmm. Well, just like I said, that wedding may, must have been a super spreader event. It's, you know, I got sick. Who did that to me? And, and I think that in terms of that's creating social distancing, it's creating relationship distancing because people are, are kind of in that accusatory blame finding mode. And that's sad as a, as a community volunteer to see my community being splintered in that way. They're the mask wearers and the non-mask wearers. That's sad as well. No, it's, it's, you know, it's obviously very challenging and, you know, really you know, you've really suffered on, on, on such a level, which is, you know, which we can't comprehend uh, if you haven't been part of it. Do you, do you feel that there's any um, long-term, you know, social, economic, emotional impacts of, of, on the community, what you went through? Not, you know, both, you, obviously the community as a whole, but the Hebra particularly. Is there, you know, how, how does, how is that? How, how are you looking at that? There, there were so many impacts. In my real life, I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. And the impact on the educational system has been enormous. Zoom is wonderful, but the technical term is we're eisgezoomed. We had enough of this. I can't expect grades kindergarten through grade 12 to sit in front of a screen all day and watch a talking head. So the educational system needs to be rethought and rejiggered. And how do, do I expose children? Do I not expose children? Do I have the mask? Do I have the partition? So all that is going on. And there's a lot of, um, you know, my, my school's doctor says this, your school's doctor says that. So there's a lot of splintering. And I think we're going to have to do a lot of work on healing. Um, it, in terms of any community organization, there was one of the Rosh Hashivas in our neighborhood was very sick. He was on a respirator. He went back to Yeshiva yesterday and all over local social media, there was, you know, videos of him coming in. And then the comments started after the Baruch Hashem and he's a Gadol Hador and may he live and be well. There was the third guy from the left isn't wearing a mask. No wonder the Rosh Hashiva got sick. And I think that's, our mindset and we need to get out of that mindset. So there's that impact where it's almost like, you know, if you, if you were once a smoker and then you stop, you sniff people for a little while to see if they smoke or they don't, you know, kind of, I don't even know why is it jealousy or is it paranoia, but there's, but there's that same aspect of, do I feel safe when you're invited to a simcha? Do I feel safe when people send invitations and, and, you're not sure if, if you, this is somebody who I want to celebrate with. The people who live across the street from me, their daughter got married. I didn't go to the wedding. This child grew up in my house and I'm not at the wedding because that's what the right thing for them. So there's that impact. Economically, we've been hit. Small business owners, especially in the red zones, have been closed for months. Restaurants, um, catering places, all these places have been hit and it's a trickle down. I'll use my shul as an example. We have the largest shul in the Far Rockaway Five Towns area. There's probably two weddings, bar mitzvahs, whatever, a week. That's a source of revenue to the shul. Sure. Hasn't happened since Pesach. And That's I it. assume that, you know, love it or hate it, funeral, right. funeral revenue is a source of revenue, perhaps, the shul. Right. I, I mean, you know, the Hever Kedisha charges for their services, um, but, you but know. that's still that's still we roll it. It's rolled in. It's not you know that hasn't changed. If anything, in terms of emotional investment, I think there's been more because I'm on the phone as opposed to being with them. There, there's there's more of that. So there's the economic impact. There's the educational impact. I think there's been a religious and social impact. The backyard minions. Um, on an Last year on Rosh Hashanah, there were 750 people sitting in my in the main sanctuary of my shul. This year on Rosh Hashanah, we were allowed to have seating. It was supposed to be at 50% capacity, which would have meant, let's say, three, 350, 375. I seated 125 men. That was it. People are afraid to go to shul. They're afraid to go to shul. They've mm -hmm. stopped 
the rabbi's role, and I'm not qualified to speak to that in, at length, but the rabbi's role has changed dramatically. There's no longer a sermon because even when we go to shul, it's in and out. We want to minimize the amount of time that you are exposed. Yard sites, as opposed to being a time where you'll see somebody who may not go to shul all the time, have become a time where it's just they'll mail in a check and say, I'm not coming to shul because of COVID. So we've lost the opportunity to interact with that person who may not be as connected and doesn't see shul as the center of his life. On the other hand, I will say that in terms of Torah learning, since people are working from home and have much more flexibility in their schedules, I think the amount of classes that are being given by Zoom has exploded. And you can access, I, you know, I don't need time to drive from one shul to the other. I can be in, in, I can sit at my computer for six hours straight and hear seven master teachers, one after the other, in the comfort of my living room or my kitchen or on my smartphone. So there is that. And I think that's presenting a challenge to the shuls in terms of their programming. How are we going to keep up that level of programming once we can reopen? Socially, I think, um, interestingly, I think people are thinking their choices in terms of who they interact with and who they relate with. In New York, a 500 person wedding is an average wedding. That's, that's just the way it is. That's the way New Yorkers work. They also, they, there's family and they're all here and it's easy to get everybody, even if you don't live that close, it's all accessible. And now because of COVID, you're starting to think and maybe make like a hierarchy or, a, or, a, or a, an A-list, not in the sense of, you know, you're better, but who are the people that really matter to me? Mm-hmm. If I were to make a simcha tomorrow, and I want my mother there. Who else do I really want there? Because I can't have more than X amount of people. And I think in that sense, it's the opposite of being a Facebook friend. where Everybody's your friend. You're really thinking about your friendships. We've also acting on our friendships in different ways. I have a very dear friend who's undergoing chemo. I visit her once a week until Pesach. And now I talk to her every day on the phone. You know, as we're going through this conversation, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, before we started talking, uh, you know, I just felt we were going to hear uh, a story about a community, obviously, which is much, much larger than ours, but right. which was experiencing something completely different from what we were experiencing. And what I'm finding is that our community is experiencing the same thing. We may not have the deaths, thank God, right. for us. But we have the same issues. We have only 50 people allowed in our shul for a certain right. Rosh Hashanah this year was instead of one large, we have, I think, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, about 1,500 seats in our synagogue. And uh, that's normally full on Kol Nidre. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, um, but we can only put 50. So instead of one service, we were having much shorter multiple services at the same time in seatings, like if you will. Right. And it was, um, it worked. And I think maybe some people actually liked that it was a much quicker, right. <laughs> but uh, it wasn't, it wasn't the same. You didn't have the, it wasn't the same feeling, you know? And um, so really our communities have faced the same challenges right. and struggles, save to say that yours has faced a lot, the additional right. uh, pain and suffering of all of the, of all of the death that you've had to have to deal with. Coming back to that, you know, in business, uh, you know, there's a, the company spent a lot of time and effort on dealing with enterprise risk management, ERM systems. Right. And, you know, they develop plans to deal with risk events should they ever occur. Sometimes you wonder, I've seen these ERM plans. Sometimes you wonder if when the emergency really happens, whether they actually do anything, but have you, um, have you developed any plans from what you've learned that God, you know, should this, you know, should this particular pandemic flare up again, or, you know, down the road, if there's another kind of mass casualty type event, have you learned anything from your experiences as a Heber Kaddish, as Heber Kaddisha? I think we've learned that we need to be able to be flexible and pivot which is when you think of a Hebra Kaddisha, it's 
tradition. You know, you've got the fiddler on the roof in the background. We're doing it exactly the same way our forefathers did it. Um, my chevra, it's interesting. I'm the only person in the chevra who speaks Yiddish, but when we ask forgiveness at the end, we do it in Yiddish and in English. So we, we're so tradition and we do it exactly the same way. I remember when gloves were introduced, it was like a big deal. We had to ask the rabbi if we could start wearing gloves mm -hmm. to protect ourselves. This goes back 40 years. Um, so it's, it's very, you know, we, we, we were like very structured. And I think now we've learned that you need to be able to pivot. We always, we need to go with the flow always. You always have something unexpected happen at, at a Tahara, but we have a framework. And now we realize that that framework is not made of wood. It's probably made of elastic. And it, it stretches, it contracts, and it expands to fit the circumstance. So that's one thing that I think we've learned. Another is that we need to care for the health of our Hebrew members. And it's become much more important to me. Um, New York State regulations, as far as the Hever Kadisha, there are none. We voluntarily, most of the Hevers in the New York area have now put into place that you need to be tested for COVID once a month, even if you're not showing symptoms. Just because I don't want you in that tiny little Tahara room endangering somebody else. Remember that the majority of your Hever members are older. So they're automatically at risk, at higher risk. So we've become more aware and sensitive to the health of our members. Uh, I used to just remind them at the Zion Adar, don't forget your hepatitis shot. Now there's more to it than that. We've also become more sensitive to the emotional health and well-being of our members. We realize that this is, it's traumatic. It's, it, it is a trauma. It's a gaping hole. When you look at the local Jewish paper and the Shiva listing takes four pages. When shuls run out of Shiva chairs, yeah. it's a trauma for everybody, but we're on the inside. We're seeing it. We're hearing it. We're getting the phone calls. And then we're dealing with the regulations in New York were until a few weeks ago, family members could not be at a bedside. So then we're dealing with survivor's guilt. I wasn't there when my dad passed away. Right. And that's that's another thing that falls upon the clergy. And I would say the Hebra, because the clergy is there and they are so overwhelmed. But we're the ones who are sitting there and waiting for the limo and dealing with the paperwork. So we're the ones that have the opportunity to engage in that conversation as well. You know, uh, you mentioned Zion Adar in, in um in uh, Vancouver, we celebrate the work of the Chavar Kedisha on Chai Sar, and that's why we're doing this, right. uh, this program here tonight uh, in uh, anticipation of Chai Sar this week. Um, many, if not all, of our Chavar Kedisha members who come from a broad range of synagogues, we right. have members of our, of our Orthodox congregation, we have members of Conservative, uh, Reform, um, as well as the, uh, the other the other organizations that, that exist out there in our communities are, are here right now on this program watching. Do you have a message for them? I think the message is we can do it. Don't give up. It's a challenge, but we are blessed to be able to, to be the messengers that confront that challenge. I always say Hever Kadisha are my favorite people. Um, you know, people think, oh, you're in the Chavar Kadisha, you must be so depressed, you must be so, so, so down, you must be so death oriented and morose. Okay, I know where I'm going to be buried, and I do own my Tachrichim already, because that's a German custom, and my, our family are Yekis. But I'd like to think that I look to life, and that, that we look at the Chavar's functioning as being life affirming, not as being death affirming. We are blessed with the opportunity and the merit to do God's work and to grant the final dignity to show this person you are created in the image of God. It doesn't make a difference what you did and who you were. We're all equal and we are here. The Hebra Kadisha are the facilitators that will present you back to your father in heaven. Thank you. You know, I have one last question for you and maybe the most important question of all. You did mention that you had been very sick. I'm not going to ask you for your medical history, but I presume from that comment that you perhaps were infected with COVID. I don't know. You don't have to disclose it. But 
my question for you is not just from a perspective of are you better from the COVID that you may not have had, are you okay? There are days that I'm not. Thank you for asking because people forget to ask the people that are busy asking everybody else. Um, there are days that I'm not. Everybody's human. You hit a wall and you have to really stop and think about what's important and what do I need and what do I have to do? And if it means walking into a room and closing the door and just crying because Heaven members don't cry. We're the strong ones. If it means going at five in the morning, walking in the dark, just because that's a place where I can just be myself, do that. Um, it's hard. We need to take care of ourselves. You know, they always say when you get on the plane and they, they do the speech that nobody listens to about the safety, you know, fastening your seatbelt, and then they show the oxygen mask. And they say, if you're traveling with a young child, put your mask on first. I'm a mother. I'm a grandmother. If I saw my child in distress, wouldn't I put it on them first? No, because I need to take care of myself in order to be able to take care of them. It's so important for the people that are, are at that front line, the Hebrew Kaddisha members, the clergy, the, 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 the healthcare workers, and everybody else. We need to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. And if we don't see it as selfishness, but rather as selflessness to say, I'm going for a walk for an hour. I'm turning my phone off for an hour after I called my co-head so he knows to put his, to keep his on. Then, then you will be better able to care for others in the future. So it's an investment in your ability to care for others. So am I okay? Most of the time, Hashem, I really am okay. There are days where it's tough. Chalmai Pesach, I don't want to go through that again on so many levels. How many funerals? How many, how many, let's prepare for a non-shiva shiva for after the holiday. Let's finish being depressed that I made a six pound brisket for two people and the grandkids are all calling and asking the Manashtana over the phone. All those different overlays are happening. But most of the time, I am okay. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to be okay. And I look forward and I hope and pray that we merit the blessing that Hashem gives those who are involved in public. That Hashem will look out and protect us. That's all I can hope for. Amen. You know, Gita, I want to thank you so much for taking the time this evening to chat with me. You know, My pleasure. Our, our community was luckier than most in that we watched the worst impact of COVID-19 for the most part from afar. Pandemics don't discriminate, though, and we all know, and we all need to remain vigilant until such time as this healthcare crisis passes. On behalf of our Hever Kadisha, and by extension, our entire Jewish community here in Metro Vancouver, I thank you for your service to your community and pray, with God's help, uh, this crisis will end soon so we can enjoy our lives. Amen. And once the quarantine business is over, I'll come visit Vancouver. We will hold you to that. Chaya okay. 2021, we've got you booked. Yes, Rana Hashem. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Gita. My pleasure.